Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our Community Council webinar covering clinical trials. I am Stephanie Ishu, Director of Communications at EB Research Partnership. EBRP is the largest funder of EB Research committed to discovering treatments and cures for patients and their families. We want to thank our 2019 Community Council sponsors, Fibercell, CIBC, Innovation Banking, and Castle Creek Pharmaceuticals. We have seven presenters tonight. Presenters will answer questions after their presentation, so please feel free to use the chat box on your screens to send questions along the way. If any questions come up after the webinar, you can always send them to EBRP at info at ebresearch.org. With that, we will begin with Dr. Gorell's presentation. Hello and welcome to Clinical Trials 101. My name is Dr. Emily Gorell and I'm a postdoctoral clinical research fellow at Stanford in the dermatology department. And prior to medical school, I was a clinical research coordinator for a long time at Stanford uh, focused on EB research. Uh, so I wanna thank EBRP for giving me the opportunity to speak with you all today about uh, clinical trials and just kind of a brief overview of what being in a clinical trial means. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so what is clinical research? So clinical research is any research that deals with patients. Uh, so there's clinical research and then there's also basic science research or bench research, which is you know where you think of someone's working in a lab, pipetting or doing something with mice. Clinical research can encompass um, investigating how disease happens, uh, can look at new treatments such as clinical trials, it can look at disease distribution, which is uh, a branch of clinical research called epidemiology, and clinical research can investigate the most effective or efficient treatments, and that's considered outcomes research. So there are a lot of regulations for clinical trials. Um, there's two main uh, branches of, re of uh, regulation, uh, the federal level and then at the institutional level. Um, and the federal level is really regulated by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. And they, uh, so if someone wants to start a clinical trial and it's a brand new first in human clinical trial, um, the first thing that you do is you submit an investigational new drug application. And it's a very long document that includes not only your clinical research protocol, but also an in-depth review of any prior studies, any research that's been done in mice, anything in the lab, um, anything that you can actually present to the FDA they want to see. Uh, and then once they approve that IND, you can start uh, your clinical research, but you're not done uh, dealing with the FDA. You have to submit annual reviews and updates to them anytime you change the protocol. Anytime there's a serious adverse event, uh, you have to notify the FDA. A serious adverse event is um, any sort of side effect that is life-threatening and causes hospitalization or, God forbid, death. Um, and then uh, once you are um, ready to submit your uh, drug for commercialization, for it to be available um, commercially, you submit what's called a new drug application. And when you do that, um, you include all of the information from all of the clinical trials that you've done previously. So that's the FDA level, um, but there's also regulation at the institutional level. So for example, at Stanford, we have our own institutional review board that reviews any research protocol that is going to happen at Stanford that in any way involves people. Um, so they will review your protocol. They will also review the consent form. And this is a document that you sign when you enter a clinical trial. And uh, I'll talk a lot about the consent form going forward because this is really the document that uh, we use to tell uh, patients or clinical trial patients what uh, is gonna happen in the study. And there's a lot of regulations about what goes into the consent form. And I'll talk about that in a bit. 
Additionally, the IRB reviews any study materials that patients actually receive. So any sort of advertisements that we put out there to recruit for clinical trials has to be approved by the IRB. Any study diaries that we give out have to be approved by the IRB. Um, so you can see there's a lot of regulation. And ultimately, the goal of this regulation is to make sure that clinical trials are safe they're performed ethically and that any harms are minimized. So we want um, our clinical research to be as safe and transparent as possible. So there are several different phases of clinical trials. And when you learn about a clinical trial and there's a study name, the first part of it usually is the phase number. So as the phases um, increase, as you go from one to four, they enroll uh, more and more patients. Uh, so the first phase is where you're really looking at safety and dosage, because this is typically the first time that this uh, drug or investigational product has been used in humans. And this is where you have that initial IND filed is right here. Um, often in EB, um, because there's so few uh, patients available, because it's such a rare disease, you can see it will often combine like phase one and phase two together so that we were looking at safety, dosage, efficacy, and side effects all together in one. So phase two studies are looking at what efficacy, meaning does the drug work? Um, does it do what we think it does? And then side effects, um, you know, anything that happens health-wise related to the drug. And anytime you go from phase one to phase two to phase three, et cetera, the FDA has to approve, um, has to approve it. So you submit to the FDA. At phase three, um, this is again, a larger study than you know phase two. And this is again, looking at efficacy and the monitoring for adverse reactions. And between phase three and phase four, there's this big hurdle that's the NDA application, because in here, this is where uh, the drug is then available commercially. So phase four studies typically are uh, looking at efficacy and safety compared to drugs that are available on the market. Um, and then obviously these are much larger studies. So how to speak clinical trial. Um, I know that in, in medicine, we generally do speak our own language, but we do try to make it so that way patients do understand, but I know clinical trials are their own special brand of, uh, of vernacular. So a placebo is a word that we use all the time, and this is a sugar pill. So this is something that looks identical to whatever the study medication is, but it doesn't contain any active drug. Um, and this is because uh, sometimes if someone takes a medicine, the very act of taking a medicine can make you think that it's working. So that's why we do what's called placebo-controlled studies. And that's where a patient can receive the placebo or they can receive the active medicine. And there's another type of study called an open phase study. And in this phase of a study, everyone gets the active drug and there is no placebo. Another type of uh, trial is a double blind study. So the double blind studies really are the gold standard for clinical trials. The gold standard, standard is a randomized double blind placebo controlled study. That means that at random, so we don't like, you know, like flipping a coin, you can be assigned to either receive the study drug or receive a placebo and the participant does not know which treatment they get and study doctors don't know which treatment that they get. Um, and then at the very end of the study, all the data is analyzed and that tells us if this treatment actually is effective. There's another type of study called a single blind study. And that's where the, uh, the patient doesn't know which treatment they're gonna get, but the study doctors do know. However, the, the gold standard really is this double blind randomized placebo controlled study. So, you do have responsibilities of being a participant in a clinical trial. The researchers have their responsibilities to the FDA and the IRB, and the participants have their responsibilities as well. I think the most important one is to understand what the study entails. And at Stanford, one of the things that we do is we send out the consent document 
way ahead of time. You know, before we start scheduling you know, travel, scheduling appointments, we send out the consent documents. You can read it so you can ask any questions that you have. And there really are no stupid questions. We really want to make sure that we answer all of your questions before you enter into a study. Uh, some other things that are important in being in a study is showing up to study appointments. I mean, yes, we want you to show up to your non-study appointments too, um, but it is really important for us that you show up to the study appointments. Um, I already talked about asking questions, but I think it's worth mentioning again, it's that important. Um, we also want to know about any adverse events and medication changes. Um, so as part of a clinical trial, we have to record everything that happens to you during that trial, whether or not it's related to the study. Uh, you've probably seen those advertisements on TV where they list out all these, this giant list of side effects. Well, part of the reason why they have that giant list of side effects that sound like they're probably worse than whatever the disease is that they're treating. The reason why they have all those is that um, when you're part of a study, we want to know everything that happens, and then they have to list all those things that happen. Um, so we do want you to also take your study medication as directed. If you don't take your study medicine, then we don't know if it's working. And we want to make sure that you complete your study diaries. So a lot of studies have a diary where you either check a box saying like, yes, I took the medicine. This is the day I took the medicine. Or you rate um, some sort of, you know, like rating your pain, rating your itch, something like that. Um, I call it your homework. Um, but there's a, usually a, re there's a reason why we're asking you to do that. So it's real important that you do complete those if um, the study investigators are asking you to do that. You do have rights as a participant in the study, and all of these things are included in the consent document. That's part of why the consent is so long. So you should be told about um, what the research is, why they're doing it, any procedures, drugs, devices that are going to be used in the study, any potential risks, discomfort, or harms um, should be spelled out, as well as any potential benefits. Alternatives to the study are also have to be included in the consent form. And um, clinical research, uh, your participation is always voluntary and you can withdraw at any time. There may be procedures involved with withdrawing if you want to withdraw early. Like for example, the study may say that you have to get you know, safety labs drawn or something if you want to withdraw. But you can because it's voluntary and you are um, you do have a right to be given a copy of the signed consent form. Clinical trials are funded through typically through grants or through industry. Uh, grants are usually for more investigator initiated studies. So if you know, say I wanted to start a study, um, I would probably try to get a grant. Um, and because I'm not part of a biotech company. So these are often smaller scale studies and these grants can be from nonprofits like the NIH or, or sorry, from the government like the NIH or from nonprofit organizations like EBRP who sponsors um, a lot of EB clinical research. And the other option is that clinical trials can be funded through industry or pharmaceutical companies. And, you know, I know there's a lot out there about big pharma, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's inherent bias in the clinical trial. Because while industry may be funding it, there are independent uh, study monitors that make sure that the study is conducted according to all the regulations. And the study is conducted independently by investigators. So some resources where you can find out more about clinical trials. I love this website, clinicaltrials.gov, um, because every research study that is involving a treatment, investigational treatment in the United States, has to be registered on this website. So you can literally go on this website, search for EB, and you can find every single clinical trial that's out there about EB right now. Uh, this FDA website and the Stanford Human Subjects website also give some really good background about what clinical trials are and just more about what I talked about today. These are my references for my talk. And thank you for your time. If you have um, questions, you can email them to me or I think that uh, there's some, I'll be taking questions directly after this in the webinar. Thank you.
Are there any questions for Emily? If so, you can write them in the chat. Okay, thank you, Dr. Grell. Um, we'll, while we're waiting to see if there are any questions, I will start Dr. Chu's presentation and you can continue to write your questions in the chat box. My name is Dr. Albert Chu, and I'm a dermatologist and faculty member at Stanford. We're excited to share with you a new study that we are conducting focused on a new treatment called Serlopidin for EB-related itch. This study is a major part of our effort to try to better understand and reduce the chronic itch that can arise in EB, and we're grateful to EBRP for helping to make this research possible. In terms of disclosures, this research is supported by EBRP, and the study here was designed by the team at Stanford, though Menlo Therapeutics, a pharmaceutical company, provided medication at no cost to conduct the study. Chronic itch, also called pruritus, is a common problem for many patients with EB. In 2015, a survey of over 200 EB patients found that itching was actually reported as the worst complication of EB across patients of all EB types. At Stanford, we often talk about an itch scratch blister cycle, where itching, which is often worse at night, leads to scratching and new blisters, which in turn causes even more itch. This can be a pretty relentless cycle. Unfortunately, the current treatments that we have access to, like topical steroids, antihistamines, and other medications, are often unable to significantly improve the itching. In recent years, there's been increasing understanding of the causes of itching, including identification of many nerve-related signaling pathways. Serlopidin is a once-daily medication that targets one part of a pathway that we think likely plays a significant role in EB-related itching. On the right, you can see that this pathway is related to substance P, which eventually leads to generation of itch. Serlopidin helps to disrupt this pathway, and we hope that this plays an important role in breaking up um, some of the itching that can occur in EB. This medication has already shown some promising effects in other chronic um, itching conditions, which is why we were so excited to try and bring this to the EB community. Our current trial is actually based off the promising results of a pilot study that was also made possible by EBRP. We recently reported the results of this 14 patient pilot study in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology last month, and the article should be open access to anyone interested in reading it. If you go online and look for serlopitans in treatment of epidermolysis uh, bullosa related itch, uh, you should be able to find links to it to read the article. Participants in this first study were 13 years and older, and uh, patients of any EB type were eligible to participate, though in this particular trial, most patients ended up having recessive dystrophic EB. All of the patients had chronic itch, and on average, this was pretty severe, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being very little itch and 10 being the worst possible itch, our participants reported an average itch of 6. Fortunately, during this study, we found no major safety issues with the medication. The most common side effects were headache and nausea, which fortunately was pretty uncommon and consistent with prior studies with this medication. We did observe a, a greater reduction in itch with serlopidin as compared to patients who received a sugar pill. While not all patients who received serlopidin improved, we saw that those that did sometimes had fairly significant improvements. For example, if you look at the chart on the right, you can see that more patients with serlopidin, highlighted in blue, experienced at least a three-point reduction in itch on a 1 to 10 scale as compared to those who didn't receive it. However, as this was only a very small trial, we hope to have more participants to really have confidence that this was a real effect. 
Based on this, we're currently enrolling patients for our larger follow-up study. This study does require two trips to Stanford in Northern California, though we are able to reimburse travel expenses through the help of EBRP. The first two months of this trial are, are kind of the critical part of it. This is a double blind phase, which means that neither the doctors nor the participant knows whether they received sirlopidin or a sugar pill. The most important part of this study involves patients filling in an itch diary each evening, reporting how much itch they experienced during the day. This helps us to get a sense of whether the sirlopidin is helping them or not. At the end of the study, everyone will get the option to receive the medication free of charge for a year as part of an open label study to evaluate the safety of the medication. This is a nice part of the study because it's anyone who is assigned to get the sugar pill um, or sirlopidin will have the ability to get the real medication and continue it for up to 12 months if they feel is helpful for them. Overall, I just want to emphasize that we took great lengths to make the study as easy as possible on participants. For safety, we do have to do monthly blood and urine tests while you're on the medication, but we are able to use outside labs if uh, there's another blood draw for other reasons by a primary care doctor, a hematologist. Also, um, we just want to note that no skin biopsies are required for this study. And in order to qualify, our participants have to be 13 years or older and suffer from chronic severe itch. Uh, patients of any type of EB are, are welcome to inquire about participating. And again, uh, the study is going to be fairly similar to the initial pilot where it's uh, two months of double blind with that one year of open label afterwards. The goal for this study is to help determine if sirlopin is safe and effective for easing EB-related itching. We're so grateful to all the patients who have already joined in to take part in this trial. And one of the other points that we try to highlight to anyone who wants to join us for this study is that, yes, while we hope that this medication really works, uh, this is really important work to help highlight the issue of chronic itching and EB overall. And we hope that it will stimulate further research in this area to help tackle this challenging problem. We welcome you to come visit our website to learn more about this study. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to our coordinator, Claudia. Uh, here's her phone number and also her email address. And we'd love to get in touch with you and answer any questions that you have. Finally, we just want to thank EBRP who made this study possible and also acknowledge Menlo Therapeutics for providing the medication free of charge for this study. Thank you very much, Dr. Chu. Are there any questions? And uh, Emily and I are both here, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to just, you know, type in at any point. We're always happy to get back uh, to you either through the webinar or email you. I'm sure through EBRP we can also, um, if you want to provide them with your information, reach out to anyone who wants to chat with us about anything. I will provide an email address from EBRP so that we can provide Dr. Chu and Dr. Grell with any questions that might come up after the webinar is over. Um, thank you both for your time. Okay, with, with that, we will move on to Dr. Sumre from AMRIT. I have his presentation right here. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Mark Summeray. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Amrit Pharmaceuticals. And it's a pleasure to talk to you today about the work that Amrit is doing in the field of EB. 
Um, just before I go into a bit more detail, um, just a couple of words about the company. Uh, Amrit is a small uh, biopharmaceutical company. It's based in Europe, in Ireland, and um, it's quite a young company, hasn't been around very long, um, but it's totally dedicated to developing new treatments for patients with rare diseases and orphan diseases. And uh, the lead product that we have in our pipeline is actually the product I'm um, the uh, research that I'm going to tell you about now, uh, and that's a topical product for the treatment of EB. So <clears throat> just a, a very brief explanation about what this product is. Um, as you can see from the picture I put up, uh, it's actually derived from a natural source. So um, the way that we create this topical product, and by topical I should explain that I mean it's administered by application to the wounds on the skin. So it's not like a tablet, uh, it's not ingested, or it's not taken by mouth, it's actually a, a gel um, which is applied to the wounds. Um, the product is actually made by using a special extraction process that takes naturally occurring um, molecules uh, that are found in the bark of the birch tree. And uh, you can see there on the, the photograph that uh, when you use this extraction process, you end up with a dry powder, which you can see at the bottom of the slide. And that dry powder we call the triterpene extract. Now just <clears throat> also to emphasize that the triterpene extract it contains molecules that are found in other natural sources as well, like olives and different kinds of berries and fruit. Um, now what we, we do is we mix that dry powder um, with sunflower oil. So as you can now tell, <clears throat> this topical gel, this product, is actually made on entirely of naturally occurring substances. It doesn't contain any synthetic molecules. It doesn't contain preservatives or stabilizing agents, or other additives. It is just a mixture of sunflower oil and this natural extract from the bark of the birch tree. And when you mix the two together in the right combination ratio, you end up with a gel. And the gel is what um, we put in that tube that you can see the photograph on the right side of the slide. Now, <clears throat> I'm, there's a lot of information on this slide. I'm not going to go through it all, but the reason that I put this slide up is just to show you that this product has actually been studied quite a lot over the last few years, um, not in the treatment of EB, but in other situations where patients have a wound on the skin. So this can occur, as I'm sure you uh, would be aware, if you burn yourself, um, or if you have a surgical procedure where a surgeon takes a piece of skin from one part of the body and uses it to graft somewhere else, um, you have a wound which the surgeon has created that you need to heal. And this topical gel product was tested in three quite large phase three studies uh, the phase three study you heard about just before is the study that you do generally immediately before you expect to have enough information to give the FDA so that they can consider approving the product for commercial use. So this product was tested in another situation and it was found to significantly increase the speed of wound healing. So this is really important because it means that there's already data that show that this uh, extract in, in the gel has activity in accelerating the healing process. Now, the information that we gathered from these studies was submitted to the European Medicines Agency and led to the approval of this gel product for B but for these other kinds of wounds. And um, when Amrit 
became involved in the development of this product, we uh, saw that there was an opportunity to direct the, the future development um, to treat wounds that patients get who have EB. And so <clears throat> you see at the bottom of that slide, it says high medical need. And we do think that um, there's an opportunity for us potentially to help patients who have wounds as a result of EB. And that's the reason why we're studying this topical product in EB. So we've implemented a large global phase three trial, which we call the EASE trial. And it's with the gel product you see there, it's a bit of a long name, it's, it says Olea Gel S10. And that's just the um, sort of uh, more technical term for the gel that we have developed. And the purpose of this phase three study is to assess whether or not the product works by accelerating the healing process and whether it's well tolerated and, and safe. And that's the reason for the study. Now, um, I should say, of course, and you will all be very aware of this, in some ways, fortunately, EB is not a very common disease. So that means that when we have to find patients who would be interested in participating in the study, we have to go to a lot of places around the world. And you can see those countries that are colored up in green there and the list to the left. We are in many, many countries, um, you can see, 55 sites in 27 countries. This is truly a global clinical trial. And um, we already have, uh, you know, we're all well on the way to fully enrolling the study. The, the total number of patients that we hope will participate before we finish uh, allowing patients to, to participate is about 240. So that is actually a very large clinical trial in EB. Let me tell you a little bit about the design of the study. You've already heard about the, the so-called gold standard or the, or the best uh, design for a clinical trial is a double blind, randomized placebo controlled trial. And that's exactly what we're doing. So that means that when patients are entered into the trial, they're randomly allocated either to the, the active product that I mentioned to you or to a placebo uh, gel, which looks completely identical to the active, but doesn't contain the extract from the birch bark that I showed you at the beginning. And the patient doesn't know whether or not they've got the active or the placebo, and neither does the doctor, the investigator, the study team, uh, and neither do we, actually, the company. There's only a few people who know the identity of the true randomized treatment, and that is truly a double-blind design. And when patients are entered into the study, um, they are given the gel product to apply to all of the wounds on the body, um, but we select one of the wounds to determine whether or not the product is working um, to assess what we call the primary endpoint. It's just, it's the most important endpoint for assessing whether the product is working or not. Um, but we have lots and lots of other endpoints as well, which endpoints are basically evaluations that we do to measure whether or not we are seeing an effect. And it's important not to focus only on the healing of the wounds, because there's all sorts of other relevant effects that might be benefit, maybe may beneficial effects to patients with EB, such as redu reduced itch or um, uh, decreased incidence of infection, for example, uh, decreased pain, particularly on, on changing dressings. Um, so we're measuring all of these uh, things in the trial. Um, now, the, the, at the end of a three-month period, the double-blind treatment period uh, phase ends, and all of the patients, the half of the patients that were randomly allocated to placebo are active and stay in the trial for two more years of long-term follow-up.
<clears throat> that's important too. Um, the other thing I should mention is that the focus of the study um, is for EB patients who have uh, dystrophic EB, whether that's recessive or dominant, and junctional EB. But we're not studying um, EB simplex patients in this trial. Um, if we're successful um, with the study and um, it looks as though the product is working, then we would probably do a, a subsequent study to look at EB simplex separately. I mentioned just now that we're looking at a lot of endpoints. They're all listed out here. I'm not going to go through them all. But it's just to say that it's very important that we do a comprehensive evaluation of the potential benefit of this product. So we've had some good news while we've been conducting the study. Um, the Independent Data Monitoring Committee, which is an independent safety, a group of physicians who monitor the safety of the study, um, did an interim analysis. So the individuals on that committee were aware of the identity of which patients were receiving the product versus placebo. And after that analysis, they recommended that the study should continue with a slightly increased total size. And we consider that to be quite encouraging because if there wasn't any suggestion that the product could be working, the study would have been finished uh, at that point. So we've got some promising data, even though we don't know any of the details. In addition, the, the Data Monitoring Committee allows us to enroll children um, who are as young as just three weeks of age. So that was a, a decision that was made after review of the early safety data. So that's also encouraging. <clears throat> just coming up to uh, the end of this presentation, I wanted to mention something very briefly about our pipeline. So in addition to the EASE trial that I just explained, uh, which is a phase three study, we also have something very early in development. You heard about the preclinical phase of, of testing. This uh, product is in that very early phase. It's a topical gene therapy product that doesn't use a virus to deliver the gene. So most, not all, but most approaches um, have used a virus because viruses are very good at getting genetic information into cells. Our approach is based on a polymer, which, which avoids the need for a virus. We're not in clinical studies yet, um, but we hope to be in the very near future. And just to give you a, a very brief glimpse of what it is we're working on, we're taking some DNA, which you see on the right side, and some polymer, which is like a, a, a sort of a simple chemical structure, and we're mixing them together to form what we call polyplexes, which is uh, taken up by cells. As you can see in this picture, the, um, at the top, the polyplexes are then absorbed into the skin, go to the cells that produce the collagen, which is missing in, in recessive dystrophic EB, and um, the cells take up the DNA and start to produce the collagen protein again. And that's the idea of how it works. So I'll stop there and um, happy to take any questions uh, either now or, or later by email. Thank you very much, Dr. Samurai especially for staying up late in Europe to give us this wonderful presentation. <laughs> You're most welcome. Okay, if we get any questions after the fact, I will make sure to email them your way. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. With that, we will move on to Dr. Paller's presentation.
Okay. Okay. Now people can hear me. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Sorry, everybody. There was something on my screen that said on air, and I just assumed if I pressed it, you could hear me. Um, anyways, hi, I'm Amy Paller. I'm the chair of dermatology at Northwestern, and I have long been a, a practitioner taking care of children and adults with EB. Um, I am also an investigator, and uh, EBRP asked me to talk a little bit about a topical product that um, I am I'm merely an investigator on it. I, I don't work with the company, but um, I'll tell you a little bit about it because we've just started the study. Uh, the company that's making it is called Lennis, uh, and I've shown you here the title of, of the study, but the product itself is called Thymus and Beta 4 or RGN-137. And I'm going to very briefly just tell you about this study. It's a, a little bit of an earlier phase than we just heard about by uh, Amrit. They talked about a phase three trial. This is a phase two study in which a drug that's been shown to work for wound healing is now being applied for EB. There's some terminology you've heard, so I'm going to go through it quickly, but this is what we call a randomized. In other words, you may or may not get the product. Single blind, that means that the patient and the evaluator don't know, but the doctor, the investigator does. Placebo controlled, meaning half will get the placebo. Self-matched pairings, which means that we find two wounds on the same person and then compare their responses, one getting the placebo, the other getting the active. And the whole study takes 84 days with about every two week visits. Um, and this company will fly anybody in who wants to be part of this to uh, the closest site. Um, this is for as young as four years of age. It's a very safe topical product. Uh, and the idea is to see how well this thymus and beta-4 topical gel works in junctional and dystrophic forms of EB, and of course, to look at its safety. This is gonna be a small study, just eight up to 15 patients but again, if this is of interest to you and you're uh, interested in flying in, uh, we'll make that happen. Next, please. So I don't wanna get into anything very technical, but just to tell you a little bit about thymus and beta-4, it is what's called a peptide. So it's a string of protein bases that is naturally occurring in all tissues. And they've made a synthetic copy of this natural molecule. And this has been shown to improve wound healing through many, many means, uh, including recruitment of the, the stem cells that repopulate wounds, including through increasing uh, the vascularity, the blood vessels that are there, uh, increasing uh, the movement, the reepithelialization of cells across the wound, improving the matrix molecules or those wound uh, base molecules that allow the skin cells to re-epithelialize or migrate to close the wound, improving the adhesion of the cells to this matrix, and it has antimicrobial properties as well as tending to a tendency to decrease scarring afterwards. And then it also has anti-inflammatory properties. So lots of different properties that all may be contributing to why this may help with wounds. Next, please. Uh, so why might it be relevant to EB treatment? Well, there have been other models in other diseases, diabetes, aging, steroid treatment issues, and has shown faster healing in, in, in these various animal models. There have been trials in humans. Phase two venous stasis, what that is, is those ulcers that people get on the leg because they have varicose veins, and then pressure ulcers as well. Um, dry eye syndrome. There's a late phase clinical study going on right now, faster healing uh, in the eye. And as mentioned before, there are many actions that can promote healing that have been used to explain why this can work. Next, please. So what's been the course of this thymus and beta-4? So this was actually granted orphan drug designation by the Food and Drug Administration for EB many years ago. Um, and they were able to move forward. They completed preclinical studies. You've heard about what those are. Those are the animal studies, for example. And then phase one studies in humans, in healthy volunteers with the gel, as well as an injectable formulation. Everything was very, very safe. 
And then there have been these earlier phase two studies with indications of the stasis ulcers, the pressure ulcers, and EB. I'm going to show you some of the early data with EB. So this then went to an FDA meeting, uh, and they're still talking to plan to move towards that phase three study. But before doing that, they're doing this additional phase two study to reconfirm the study details before they move into the larger, more expensive pivotal study. And this is a little bit of a different design because as I said, this is a matched pair, single blind placebo controlled study. So two on the same person and the patient will not know which is what. The idea is to move into a larger phase three study that's being designed right now. And this study will be modified based on how this earlier study comes out. Next, please. So just to tell you, give you an idea of what happened with this topical, um, this was a double blind study, meaning nobody knew what anybody was getting. And it really was what's called a dose response study to try to look at different dosing to move forward with. So everybody got um, these various doses, vehicle, 30 subjects all together enrolled. So not very many in each group. And these patients were 18 months of age or older with dystrophic EB or at least two years of age or older with junctional EB just because you know, they wanted to make sure that, that these were the best candidates for moving forward with the study. Um, these patients had to have at least one active unroofed EB lesion that was between about an inch in diameter, or maybe three inches in diameter in size and had to have it there for at least 14 days before starting the study. So it was one that wasn't really healing quickly. And the, the primary efficacy assessment, what was the, the um, what told you that it could work, and as, as in many of these studies, was the time to complete healing. And in this relatively small early study, wounds healed by more than 50% after an additional 14 days of treatment in all of the groups, regardless of the dose, the concentration of the thymus and beta-4, as opposed to placebo. And all of the groups showed 50 to 60% versus only 32% that healed by more than 50% in the placebo group. And the early onset of healing was associated with reduced pain, reduced itch, and reduced risk of infection during this period. The safety profile was deemed quite acceptable. It was very well tolerated. There was one course of soft tissue infection um, and you never know if it was related to thymus and beta-4, but of course, infection is so common with EB. No one was hospitalized. No one had a serious side effect. Next, please. So here's the trial that we're talking about now, up to 15 subjects at five or six research centers in the United States. The concentration that was chosen was a 0.03% of this RGN-137 or thymus and beta-4. And that's applied to one wound. The placebo is applied to the other. And this goes on for a total of uh, 84 days. And you can basically see at the top here, it's just basically a syringe with this gel in it that you just put on at home. Uh, the investigator is going to assign one pair of what are called index wounds at baseline. And again, one thing goes on one side, one thing goes on the other. These wounds could be on the arms as shown here, but they really could be anywhere. Um, the surface area that's involved is very important for each of these wounds. So something in the range of about one inch across to about three inches across. But it's important that these be wounds that have been pretty stable. So uh, at least during the screening period, uh, which can be a week to two weeks, they really shouldn't be changed too much. So they should be sustained at least 80%. And there are certain areas you can't have them in, like in fold areas, fold of the neck, fold of the arms, and the groin area, for example. Um, the primary evidence of it working will be time to 50% closure of the index lesion to day 84. And then there are a wide variety of secondary uh, efficacy um, parameters. For example, time to complete healing the incidence of healing, that is what percentage will heal, uh, lesional surface area, how much reopening, so it might heal and then reopen. Um, is there a certain characteristic 
of the index wounds, looking, for example, at the redness and a variety of other um, characteristics, and then pain and itch for the patients. And you can see at the bottom kind of the timeline of this. So you know, patients will be screened, and then after screening, uh, they'll start with the baseline visit um, a week to two weeks later, and then coming in about every second week for another visit until the end of treatment with then a follow-up following that period of time. So there's several visits, but at the same time, you'll see that this is not a very onerous study. Um, next, please. And I just wanna show you, um, this is what we use as kind of a checklist of what goes on at each of these visits. At the top is one of the things that attracted me to this. Um, this is not a gene therapy study. This is not something um, that is high risk. This is something where they're taking something that's been shown to improve wound healing and moving it forward into the field of EB. There's no blood draw. There's no biopsy. You're just putting this in uh, and coming in for visits. So as you can see at each of these visits, the patients are brought into the study and the only laboratory test for those who are female and able to have children is a baseline and end of treatment urine pregnancy. Not that we think that this is gonna get inside, but just because it's required and it's, it's part of safety assessment. And then everything else here is all photography, um, finding out all of these various characteristics of the wounds and the pain and the itch and all of this and collecting diaries of capturing this information. Next, please. Uh, and again, this is the study diagram of what happens, your baseline visit, you start to apply these, and then the various periods of follow-up, end of visit, and then a post end of visit um, session to just try to see. So a very, very simple study that hopefully will move forward what might be uh, another easy to use topical to help with wound healing. Next, please. And this is the last slide I just wanna show you. Um, these are the sites that are going to be running this trial. So especially if you're anywhere near these or don't mind um, getting to one of these centers, again, um, there are there's a, a healthy travel budget I'm doing this in Chicago, Ann Lucky in Cincinnati, uh, John Browning in Texas, Leslie Costello Socio in Philadelphia, and Sharon Glick in New York City. So um, if you have any questions about this, uh, reach out to um, the EBRP people. I am happy to talk to anybody um, and help you to get linked up with one of these study sites so that you can contribute uh, and help us potentially have a new, fairly easy to use topical to move forward. So I'm gonna stop with that. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, so it seems we have a question from Vanessa and it says, is the dry eye improved through the drug as an eye drop or eye topical? Yeah, so it, it, it's, it's, it's a topical. Um, and, um, you know, I, I suspect that the, the base is different and obviously it's sterile but it's, it's been used for the eye for that. And, and you know, maybe something too that, uh, of course, EB is not just on the skin. So um, I, I, I'm very certain that if this looks good for EB on the skin, it'll be moving forward towards eye studies as well. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Pollard, for your time. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, with that, we're going to move to John Mislowski from Fibrocell's presentation, which I will pull up right now. Great, okay. All right, thank you very much, Stephanie, and thank you to EBRP and, uh, and the entire group for uh, allowing us to present today. We're happy to give you an update on our phase three trial for FCX007. And what I'll do is I'll walk through a little bit about fiber cell and, and a little bit about the technology, the cells themselves, to give you an idea of how they're produced and how we think this technology works. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll jump into some of the data we've generated with our program already, and then finalize with a little bit about the phase three trial that we've announced that we're 
um, just about to start our enrollment on and, uh, you know, plan to move through through 2020. I'm very excited about. So uh, what I'll do is I'll move forward and just talk a little bit about fiber cells. So we're a uh, biotech gene cell therapy company out in the Philadelphia area with a very strong focus on uh, rare diseases in skin and particularly in pediatrics. And as you can imagine, RDEB um, being such a devastating disorder was of um, very high interest to us when we started developing this program years ago and have been happy to move it through the clinic and now um, heading into the phase three portion. But we also are applying these cells to all sorts of different rare diseases, including localized scleroderma and, you know, eventually into others as well. Um, so really happy to see this, uh, you know, move into just treating all different sorts of disorders of the skin and eventually connective tissue. And just a little bit, you know, touched on the pipeline and, you know, we obviously have a lot of focus on uh, working on the, with the FDA and I'll talk a little bit about some of the designations and our interactions with them. And we're co-developing this product with uh, Castle Creek Pharma. You may be familiar with them as well. They've been developing uh, a program called Diacerin for the uh, Simplex subtype. And they've been a wonderful partner with us moving this into uh, late phase and eventually commercialization. But I think I'll, I'll, I'll spend a little time on a high level just about how the cells are collected and how we actually produce FCX007. So the process starts with the collection of small biopsy samples from, from patients. And those samples are then shipped overnight to our GMP manufacturing facility. So what I mean by GMP is that there's a lot of very strict and very, um, very particular rules about how we produce these cells. And the goal is to produce them in the safest most efficacious and pure way possible. And, you know, we've worked a lot of years with these cell types to bring this product to a, to such a, a standard of production. What we do is we bring them into the lab. They're um, processed by our scientists here to, to isolate out what are called the fibroblast cells. Uh, again, these are the cells that lie in the lower layer of skin or the dermis. And, you know, we, we grow these up in the lab using various nutrients and, and to a population. And then, as you've heard in earlier presentations, we use a, what's called a viral vector in order to introduce a gene to it. How we do that is these vectors are produced and coded with genes that we've created, in this case, a functional version of the COL7A1 gene, which is, of course, the, the, the culprit in what's causing uh, the problems with collagen 7 in RDEB patients. What we do here then is we introduce the, the, the viral vector. It then it then transfers its genetic information from the vector into the cells. So it basically becomes part of the cell's DNA. And then as they divide in our lab, they then carry the copies of these uh, new, new genes into the you know, daughter cells that come from it, and then it grows up into very large populations. And what we do is we freeze these cells down cryogenically, and the goal there is to create a personalized bank of these fibroblasts for each individual RDEB patient. So as they you know, come back in the future, they'll have a bank that they can actually draw from and not have to go through the biopsy and the manufacturing process um, that, that, that leads to the bank itself. What they can do is take directly from their inventory. So once we have them frozen, when it's time to actually um, produce the cells for uh, administration to the patient, we then take them, they're thawed, they're then uh, grown up in the lab just for a couple of weeks in order to get them sort of biologically active again. And then we vial them out and ship them overnight to the site for injection. And what these cells are is they're, itch, they're intradermally injected around the periphery of wounds with the goal there, our original thoughts are to, you know, sort of uh, incite the wound healing process. And then as they do that, the goal is for them to produce collagen 7 and create durability in that um, area that's now newly healed. And then our, our hope and goal as we, we, all, we all move towards is to have this have a prolonged effect in the area. And, and very briefly, this is our manufacturing facility in the Philadelphia area. We, we've had a lot of years of experience producing cells. We produced, you know, well over a thousand lots of, of history here in our site. And the FDA has been on our site and has inspected it. As you've heard earlier, there's a lot of rules around how do you conduct clinical trials and, and manufacturing. The FDA really governs all that, is even in gene therapy. And, you know, we've had this experience in this infrastructure for years and plan to use this as our commercial site to produce this you know, if and when this is approved. But what I'll do is I'll move into the program after a little bit of the overview. And again, uh, FCX007, which is a fiberblast that is 
um, introduced with a functional version of the COL-71 gene. We've had a lot of interaction with FDA on this so far, including a number of designations, including orphan drug, rare pediatric disease, fast track, and most recently, what's called the Regenerative Medicines Advanced Therapy designation. That's a long long phrase, but really what it is, it's, it's, it's sort of the okay from FDA to work with them very closely because they understand this is a serious unmet need, that this is an advanced therapy, you know, obviously not something that's, that's a typical pharmaceutical you might have in your house. Um, but they, they, and what they do is they interact with you very frequently along the way as you're developing this and give advice and, and move forward. And I'll talk a little bit about that as I get into the clinical trial. And, you know, this program has been funded not only by Fibercell, but by uh, grants from the FDA's Orphan uh, Products Development Office directly as well, who, who has uh, been funding this program. And, uh, and also EBRP. You've heard multiple um, people on the phone talking about EBRP's wonderful ability to uh, fund this type of research, and we've also had a great experience with them as well for uh, FCX007. So I'm going to skip over about the, EB, uh, the um, RDEB description. I mean, I, I know you're all very intimately aware of it, uh, just that we are targeting that disease specifically with the goal to uh, close and maintain wounds so we can avoid a lot of the health and obvious um, other issues that come with this terrible and chronic and painful disorder, and the goal there to reduce all the symptoms along with it. And what we've done is um, presented some data back in October of last year um, at the International um, SID meeting with Society of Investigational Dermatology. Uh, Dr. Peter Marinkovich, who you'll hear from next, actually presented these data and was the PI and is the PI on our phase one, two, and will be involved in our phase three trial. And these are some of the data from the poster and from the presentation he gave. And just very briefly to run through this, we presented results on five adult patients. We always begin uh, in adult patients, and then the FDA gives us clearances to move into pediatrics, which we have done. And uh, we have done this over eight wounds in these five adult patients with wound size ranging from four to about 23 centimeters squared. We've actually treated larger wounds since this data set was presented. Um, with a with the cell range that we have though, as we were working through our dosing between 10 and 27 million cells per mil. And, you know, these patients uh, were uh, dosed under conscious sedation. These were all done at Stanford University. Um, and, you know, we, firstly, obviously, what we're looking at in this trial, it was an intrapatient uh, open label. So you've heard some of the terminology today. Uh, trial where, you know, we looked at a wound on a patient, we matched it with an untreated wound and wanted to look at some of the comparisons of what happens when one wound is treated and just look at this over the course of time. Uh, from a safety standpoint, we followed patients out to 52 weeks. We have not seen serious ever events or product related events. We haven't seen any sort of issues with the vector come up in patients, which is what RCL is. And then importantly, we haven't seen localized autoantibody responses, obviously introducing a, uh, a protein that may be foreign to the patient because they haven't produced it functionally. So it's a concern, so we wanted to make sure we didn't see any immune responses. Uh, since then, we have uh, enrolled seven patients in phase two. We've dosed two of them, um, including a pediatric patient um, who are outside of this data set. But clearly, you know, we, 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 we've moved this along um, through phase two, and I'll talk a little bit about how the FDA is interacting with us on the data. But importantly, uh, the next slide is, you've heard on a number of the presentations where wound healing has, has been obviously very key as a uh, clinical outcome measure uh, for patients. And, and we, we really secondarily looked at wound healing and, and presented some data here after a single injection session of our product. So as I mentioned before, we'll inject around the periphery of wounds. And then what we're going to be doing in phase three is performing another session at four weeks after the initial. Uh, this was data just after one injection session. So obviously we want to step into a larger dose. And if you move along the table and I boxed out the complete wound healing, as you can see, 63% of the wounds we treated versus none um, display complete wound healing after dosing. And why I wanted to highlight that is in a lot of our FDA discussions, they become very interested in complete wound healing. In fact, that told us this is a an endpoint, and as you heard the terms, the measurable uh, sort of uh, item we'll be using to measure the success of the drug uh, of interest for them, where they said, you know, we can use this to actually judge the success in our phase three trial, and based on the data, you know, we, we feel confident that that could have success. And then below, you'll see some of our longer term data. Again, this was a, a picture in time 
we'll have some additional data actually coming out in the near future. But again, we, you know, we see some of that longevity going out to the year as well. And on the next slide, we, we obviously have to take samples during the phase one two trial to see if we're seeing a sort of a biological effect. Are we producing the protein? Uh, do we see evidence of that? And these are just a few examples of, um, of images of the skin. So you're basically looking at the skin in the cross section, so the epidermis above, dermis below, and, and the line you see going across is actually a image of the protein that is produced in the skin cross section. So we want to see it in the layers between skin and in that middle band is an antibody to collagen 7, so it would bind to it. And there you see that over time, we're seeing a formation of collagen 7. And we've also seen uh, evidence that the cells were there at least six months. So, you know, what we hope that from our original hypothesis or original sort of guess on how this product works is, you know, are these cells lasting and are they producing collagen? And here's some evidence to show that they, you know, they could be. And obviously, you know, the wound healing as far as a uh, clinical outcome measure does support some of that as well. So these are the data that we brought to the FDA and said, you know, we produced five or six patients worth of data. We have enrolled additional patients in phase two, but you know, what do you think, FDA? How could we move this program along to the, you know, just absolutely unmet need here? And we held a, a series of meetings at the end of 2018 into 2019, which culminated into what's called an end of phase two meeting. And as you heard, you know, as you move through the phases, there are meetings and sort of approvals to move ahead. And that was ours that was held back in April. And in there, we talked about what's the best design for a pivotal study in a, in a very advanced therapy uh, such as FCX013 based on the data that we've generated. And so what's come from that meeting is the design you see here on the slide. And what we're calling this study is DEFI RDEB. So the DEFI stands for dermal fibroblasts. And it's very similar in design to our phase one, two. It's again, an open label intra-patient design. And so what will happen are wounds on the patient will be pre-monitored for a series of at least four months or so uh, to ensure they are chronic non-healing wounds. And that's important because obviously these are the, the, the very troublesome wounds that lead to um, you know, all sorts of, uh, of, of clinical issues, sepsis, um, squamous cell carcinoma, um, and these were the ones that were a particular focus when we had our meeting with the FDA. And, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to monitor these wounds and ensure they're non-healing. And then we're going to, uh, for each patient, up to three pairs of these wounds will be treated, um, randomized and treated at the baseline or at the, you know, the point where we'll administer the product. So one of these wounds, we basically pair, pair them off generally by size and anatomical location. One will be treated with FCX007 and the other one will be untreated. So we will not be administering a placebo. Um, we agreed with the FDA due to sort of the already of the uh, kind of the impact of all this therapy. It's best to leave that untreated on the untreated wound. And then these will be compared as they go through the follow-up visits. As I mentioned before, we'll be performing two doses. Uh, there'll be a baseline dose and then four weeks post the original. And then we'll be monitoring them out to 24 weeks. So we'll have visits at four. Uh, 24, uh, 4, 12, and 24 weeks, and we're going to be doing this over 15 to 20 patients. So again, this is obviously, it's a small trial, and in the division of FDA that looks at these advanced therapies, you tend to get these smaller trials because of the sort of advanced nature and the very rare sort of instance of these diseases. And so we'll be doing this multi-center. We're obviously, as I mentioned, working with Stanford University. We're also working out of Colorado um, as well, and then, you know, we're looking at and probably two other sites we'd like to geographically spread this out to obviously make travel a lot easier. All travel is covered by the company for the trial. And, you know, what we're planning to do is bring the patients in. And then as you probably have synapsed on, we have a number of phase two patients who haven't been dosed and they'll also be asked if they'd like to participate in the phase three as well. For the primary outcome measure, we'll be looking at the proportion of wounds that were treated compared to untreated that have, have complete closure at week 12. So, uh, you know, obviously as our FDA sort of uh, you know, negotiated primary endpoint, and then secondarily, we're gonna be looking, as you've heard, a number of different types of outcome measures, including 50% uh, wound closure. We're gonna be looking at patient reported outcome measures and also durability up to 24 weeks. Uh, the collagen seven 
expression will be done as an exploratory endpoint in a subset of the population. Our goal in this trial was to reduce blood draws and biopsies as much as possible to satisfy the division of the FDA that we're regulated by. And we've done a great job coming from phase one, two to phase three, since we've learned so much to really work down the number of all the additional tests so we can make this a really accessible trial. So where we are is we've uh, had our meeting back in April with FDA. We've revised all of our protocols and submitted them back in July. And then we've also, as you can imagine, there's a lot of manufacturing and testing that has to be you know, ensure that it works and make sure it's reproducible. And a lot of that data was finalized and was submitted in July as well. So what we're doing now is the information has been submitted to our IRBs. Um, Stanford University, for instance, is moving through the process now. The goal is to have them finish up and, you know, what we we're really aiming towards is having a patient coming in shortly, you know, once that process is complete at the sites. Um, you know, we're hoping to have a lot of this work uh, process through the rest of the year and then you know we have a we have a real interest in completing enrollment rather quickly and then moving through the manufacturing and the follow-up visits to the 2020 and then hopes to have some data and thinking about a what's called a BLA or which is the application to file this with the FDA for approval uh, sometime in the end of the year moving into 21. So, you know, we've moved through this program really you know, rapidly through the last year. We've been really excited about the uh, support that we received and about the, uh, you know, the, the interactions we have at FDA. So I'd love to thank all of you and your families and all the people who participated and EBRP and all of our investigators and the staff here at Fibercell for all their hard work and really looking forward to the next update and hopefully giving you some more progress on our phase three and data. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Are there any questions? Any questions that come up after the fact, we'll email over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you all very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, um, I will begin Dr. Mrankovich's presentation now. Hi everybody, can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Um, anyway, I'm very happy to be here talking with all of you and um, I, uh, I just want to encourage folks to, um, you know, feel free to, um, ask questions, you know, uh, it makes it more fun when people ask questions and uh, it's more rather than I'm just sort of spoon feeding you all this info, it's more like sort of a, you know, an active conversation. And so I, I don't think I need to tell anybody, the speakers or the, the uh, audience, you know, how terrible a disease RDB is and how frustrating it it is uh, to have, it, uh, I don't know how it is to have it. It's, it's, I can only see how, you know, how people, how it can affect people from, from an outside observer, but I, it's obviously the kind of disease that affects not only the patient, the whole family, and it's frustrating for doctors to try to, because we usually don't have that much, many tools right now to, to tackle this disease, you know, wound care, infection, try to optimize nutrition, treat anemia, look out for skin cancers. That's pretty much it. And for a lot of, you know, for many years, I was sort of uh, working in the lab, you know, trying to develop a lot of the molecular therapies. And I'd go to these kind of talks and it would be frustrating for me because I, I you know, I'd say, well, you know, laminin-332 binds to type seven collagen. And the audience would look at me like, well, that's great, but you know, what does that do for me? And you know, it, it is so exciting now to be able to be able to sh give something to, you know, the EB community, you know, and that we're finally starting to do that. And uh, as you could hear from these previous talks, you know, lots of different companies are getting involved in this now. There's, you know, this orphan drug space, it's, it's really popular and there's a lot of great therapies going on right now and it's, it's snowballing. So 
it's an exciting time for EB, especially for RDEB right now. And so, um, as you know, it's type seven collagen is the is the target molecule in dystrophic EB. And um, you know, just to let you know, if you really want to correct the disease, you really got to put the collagen back in the skin. You know, um, you, you know, dystrophic EB is not a disorder of slow wound healing. It's not like keratinocytes. You know, the skin cells are inherently slow, and like the lack of collagen seven slows them down. And it's like we need to speed them up to be able to close the wounds. That's really not the primary problem. The primary problem is putting the collagen seven back in, and, it, and then it, it, the skin cells will attach to the wound. A lot of these chronic wounds are perpetuated by continuous trauma that's just continually blistering and removing all of the epithelium that's trying to heal. So it's not only like the time of closure of the wounds that's important. It's how long do the wounds stay closed afterwards? That's really, when you're looking at a trial, that's really what you want to look for in these EB trials is not how, how long to close is, it's helpful, but really the, the most important thing is how long did it stay closed afterwards? And that's, that's something that um, is uh, really what corrects the disease. So um, I want to just talk about the the first uh, trial that uh, we did and developed here at Stanford, me and a whole lot of really talented people like uh, Dr. Al Lane, Dr. Zurab Sipashvili, Dr. Jean Tang, you know, uh, Dr. Paul Kavari, a lot of people we worked together for a long time to develop this. And this, this uh, initial um, gene therapy trial was published in JAMA a couple years ago. We just published the, um, most recent update in Journal of Clinical Investigation Insights just a few weeks ago. And uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail of this because you can get it all out of the peer-reviewed um, journal articles. And so if you want, I, if you email me uh, or text me, I'll give you my contact info. You, I'll just send it to you. So I don't have to, you can just look at it at your leisure. But anyway, that involves taking college and seven genes taking the patient's skin, we have to do biopsies on the patient's skin, put the collagen seven genes into the skin cells, expand the skin cells, and then graft them back on the patient. Now this requires a lot of sophisticated cell manufacturing, similar to you know, these, 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 these type of facilities. And it's something along the same lines of, as what John just previously talked about. And this whole setup is very similar to what John talked about, except for we're targeting keratinocytes, the, the outer layer of the skin rather than the inner layer of the skin. So the manufacturing takes place. It can take, you know, weeks to months to finalize. And then we take the patient in the hospital and we either inject their wounds with the fibroblast, like as John described. And in this instance, we put grafts over the areas of the skin to uh, place over chronic wounds. At any rate, we have treated seven patients with this trial so far, and um, I've been involved with all the patients. It's been such, it's been a fun experience to actually see some benefit with this. And uh, so we finished the phase two trial, and we're, we're looking to do the phase three trial uh, sometime next year. And this has been uh, licensed as company Abiona, who will be helping to carry, fund and carry this forward. Um, Let's see here. And then, so the so that trial that I just described to you and um, what uh, John talked about with the fibrocell trial, which is also, I'm really enjoying working in that trial as well, is these are examples of what we call in vivo, uh, gene, ex vivo gene therapy. So what that means is the vectors that we use for those type of therapies are what we call integrating viral vectors. So they go right into the DNA and it's, it's uh, good in that the, uh, the vectors will uh, be passed on to the daughter cells. So the, the, the uh, daughter cells will receive the genes and uh, it, it uh, theoretically makes it more of a durable therapy. What we've seen in the ex vivo so far is at least we get about a year's worth or a couple of years worth, but there is a slow decline of the efficacy over time. And uh, it's something we wanna be able to improve upon with with time. 
But um, anyway, so this potential for durable therapy. Also, it, there's a s theoretical risk of inserting into a, of the genes, inserting into a, like an oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene, some, a gene that regulates cancer. So for that reason, we have to do it outside the body to make it more safe. And so that's like, the, that's ex vivo gene therapy. They involve cell manufacturing, and then we have to have some kind of a procedure where we put it back into the patient. Either in this, in the, in the grafting, we do it under general anesthesia. We have to have a hospital stay for like a week or so afterwards to make sure the grafts take. On the other hand, there's this concept called in vivo gene uh, therapy. And that is a lot simpler. Basically, we just take vectors that um, are in like a gel, for example, um, and you, you can put it directly onto the wounds. And these uh, vectors will take the genes, put them right into the skin cells, right on the wounds. So this is, this is what we call off-the-shelf therapy. So you could ship this. You don't have to, like with the ex vivo, every patient is a manufacturing one. With the in vivo, it's uh, basically you can just you don't have to do you have to do one manufacturing run for everybody and then you could ship it more easily to everybody around the world and then you can apply apply it more very easily under basic clinical conditions so you don't need a special technique to do it so i mean the reason i'm excited is that i think it can reach a lot of patients because it's a lot more easy type of a process so um and it's very, it's very complementary to the ex vivo gene therapies. So the, the first example of this is this uh, company, it used to be called ProQR, and then it just got um, transferred over to this company called Wings, which is, you know, in full disclosure, it is a uh, subsidiary of the EBRP. So this patient organization has actually, um, you know, uh, bought this company and is running this trial. And so, we have um, treated several patients so far, two pediatrics, just treated a couple of patients this week, actually. And this is a uh, type of a therapy where if the patients have mutations in the, um, in the uh, particular part of the Calden 7 gene called exon 73, this therapy can actually remove those mutations and remove a little piece of the Calden 7 gene. And then, um, then splice it back together and then um, make a slightly shortened collagen gene and then have that go into the skin and have that be functional. So, um, you know, we're part way through this trial. It's blinded, so I really can't tell you any details about the results yet. We're all, I'm, I'm as anxious as anybody to, to know, you know, to be unblinded and know what's, what the results are. But it's in process. And um, that's, uh, we're continuing to recruit patients. But just to let you know, it's only about five to 10% of the patients, of the total EB, RDEB patients would be eligible for this kind of a trial. So it's very, it's kind of a very specialized type of a therapy so far. So that's uh, the WINGS trial. And then um, I wanna to talk to you about the other in vivo trial that's ongoing, and that's uh, sponsored by uh, Crystal Biotech. And this is using an uh, HSV1 vector. Now that's the vector that causes, the virus that causes cold sores. And um, so it's the um, cold sore virus. Everybody knows that it's a virus that infects uh, skin cells pretty darn good, as good as any, uh, any virus can. And it's also the kind of a, a, a type of a vector that we know that like um, the virus can lay dormant and escape the immune detection in the skin for long periods of time and uh, only to reemerge later uh, un, undeterred by, the, by an, any kind of an immune response. So it seems to have like an immune evasive type of a property, which is actually very desirable in a uh, in a gene therapy vector because you don't want your immune system, um, you know, reacting to the to the vector. It'll just make it more difficult for the therapy to work and cause inflammation. Um, if you take away the ability of the vector to to replicate, then that takes away the disease causing uh, parts of the vector. So basically, the, you turn your vector into just this delivery vehicle for the gene that you want. 
And the nice thing is it's got a big payload, so you can put two College of Seven genes, a pretty darn big gene. It's like one of the biggest genes in nature. And we could we put two College of Seven genes in this vector. That's how big it is. It's, it's, it's like uh, the Cadillac of, uh, of vectors. At least it'll, it'll hold a lot of, lot of passengers. And uh, anyway, um, it's, um, it's, a, it's a novel approach. It does not integrate into the gene. So then, you, theoretically, you would expect that it's not going to have the same kind of a durability as like the uh, integrating retrovir or lentiviral vectors will have. So that would mean that you need, need to theoretically reapply it more often than the, um, like the other integrating vectors. But at the same time, you know, the application potentially could be um, could be easier, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So um, the um, we started, we did had some uh, promising preclinical studies, which we did here at Stanford, and that uh, <clears throat> led to the start of the phase one two trial. And uh, so what we're doing, we have intradermally injected it into patient skin, and it works that way. But uh, the topical, just applying it directly to wounds, also works. And that is going to be the main um, application, is the topical uh, gel formulation. And what we do is we apply the gel until the wounds heal, and then we evaluate the uh, healing. And we, the main thing is we look at the time to closure, but really the most important thing is we look at how long the wounds stay healed and don't re-blister over time. And that's that's the, the best approximation of collagen 7 um, acti activity is how well does it hold, keep hold the skin together after healing. And so um, just to kind of show you some uh, results, this is uh, one patient here uh, that you can see we, we took multiple fields of uh, the skin up in that upper left uh, corner there, that blue and green lit um, figure. Those are like multiple level uh, layers, uh, shots of the skin that's been pasted together to show a nice long stretch. And you can see that that collagen seven green antibody is standing a nice continual line all the way across. And you notice we're using this antibody against the NC2 domain. That's because some patients have their own NC1 expression. They don't produce a full length collagen seven, they just produce a little fragment of the NC1 domain. And so, um, Sometimes it, you, it's good to look at both. The NC2 will, will, will more guarantee that you're getting a good full-length collagen expression, basically. And then the uh, gray panels in the bottom right, those, these are magnification of the skin up to like 100,000 times. You know, that's, pr that's pretty high magnification. Uh, and at, only at that level can you actually see the anchoring fibrils. And you see those arrows there. Those are showing these little projections that are coming out of the, of the basement membrane that are being decorated with the uh, gold particles. Those are anchoring fibrils, and they actually look pretty good. I've looked at a lot of anchoring fibrils in my day, and I would say these, these are pretty good ones. <clears throat> and this is just the same thing again. We're, again, looking at the NC1, NC2 domain in another patient. And we're looking at some pretty good anchoring fibrils here as well by the white arrows, you can see them. So I'm kind of a stickler for molecular correction. I think all the, I think we really have to, in the early phases of these trials, show molecular correction. And despite me being sort of a stickler for it, I, I feel like this is, looks like we've achieved a good demonstration in um, our patients. The next, and then the most important thing, obviously, is wound closure and maintenance of wound closure. And so uh, here we see some uh, effects of the uh, topical gel on wounds. You can see that the top panel uh, is um, the, the uh, BVEC, we call it, or the uh, KB103. And you see that baseline, we got the wound there. And then by day 30, it's healed. And then it stays healed, day 60, day 90, day 120. and um, that's because the collagen 7 uh, has a long half-life in the skin, and it stays in the skin for a long period of time. And it, uh, you know, continues to help keep the wounds uh, from re-blistering. 
And then here's just another example of another wound and that you see that, um, you know, we treat the patient and then we, uh, we biopsied <clears throat> at day 90. And, uh, but you can see even after healing from the biopsy, it stays healed. <clears throat> so overall, you know, it's good wound closure. And also um, another thing I was concerned about with this trial is that the, um, we might, you know, other types of gene therapy vectors have shown inflammation after you apply them a couple of times, but I've not seen uh, significant inflammation so far. So from a safety standpoint and a patient tolerability standpoint, it looks pretty good. And so this is just a summary of the therapy. Um, you know, the topical administration is convenient. It's, uh, it's quite possible that, likely actually, that um, as we move into like a phase three trial, it'll be uh, uh, available for home use, which will make it very convenient so that you don't have to be traveling to this study site very often. Um, now that we've been able to uh, demonstrate molecular correction pretty good, even to critical people like me, um, then uh, the, we're not going to have to do biopsies. In fact, biopsies are likely going to be optional. So there'll be um, like home use, uh, optional or no biopsies. And so it'll be fairly user friendly for the, um, the patients. And, um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's got a lot of advantages and I think it's an exciting therapy that I, um, you know, look forward to seeing how the uh, patients continue to do with it. And uh, so I think I'll just pause there and um, invite anybody who wants to um, ask questions to just chime in. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. As a reminder, you can write your questions in the chat box. Um, let me also just tell everybody, um, you can reach me by email at my email address, mpm at stanford.edu. And you can also call me at um, my cell phone, area code 650-740-0589. And, or if you wanted to just call into EBRP, you know, I, I, I give you permission to give out my cell phone, at, not to like solicitors, but to actual EV patients, you can give my cell phone and my email address. And you, you all are more than, patients or families are more than welcome to call me. Love, I love hearing from you guys. All right, sorry, I'm, I'm done now. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sure everyone <clears throat> appreciates being able to contact you. Okay, I believe that there is a technical difficulty with Suma from Crystal trying to log in right now. So we're going to give it about a minute and see if she's able to, um, as a reminder, any questions can be put in the chat box. Dr. Marinkovich, are you still there? Yes. Do I need to sign off in order for the next person to sign on? No, you're fine. Um, some uh, one an EB parent would actually just like you to repeat your contact information. Oh, sure. Um, it's a uh, area code six five zero 
740-589. And uh, my, um, my email address is M as in Martha, P as in Peter, M as in Martha, at Stanford, S-T-A-N-F-O-R-D dot E-D-U. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so I don't think that Suma will be able to join us tonight, um, but thank you everyone for joining. And thank you, especially to all of our presenters for sharing updates on their work we're very, very proud to have funded a lot of this research and to see how many promising therapies are in clinical development. I'm sure all the audience is also very appreciative of our EB researchers. As a reminder, any remaining questions can be sent to us at EBRP at info at ebresearch.org and we will direct them to the right person for you. Additionally, this webinar recording will be posted on our website in the Community Council tab um, and any of you can reference back to it if needed. Thank you again for joining and have a run wonderful rest of your day if you're on the West Coast and night if you're on the East Coast. See you next time.